Béla Bartók, Hungarian pianist, composer, and musicologist, was one of the major musical figures of the first half of the 20th century. There are plenty of resources to learn more about his life and music, including Halsey Stevens's definitive study, The Life and Music of Béla Bartók, a very comprehensive book by Elliot Antokolitz, and Béla Bartók, an analysis of his music by L'Envoy. In this video, I'm going to take a very short piece from the Microcosmos Book 4 and analyze it using some of the ideas presented by L'Envoy. The Microcosmos is a set of six volumes for piano that Bartok wrote between 1926 and 1939. It includes etudes that progress from very easy to very difficult. His intent was to introduce the pianist to a more modern piano technique but I've always felt that the volumes are also an invaluable resource to composers and improvisers as a window into the creative mind of Bartok. He preferred not to talk about his compositional technique, but these graded pieces offer a fascinating perspective to his approach. In this analysis, we'll look for how his symmetric, almost crystalline structures seem to interact with an interesting sense of organization that references many traditional elements of tonality. So let's go ahead and listen to this piece. This is Bulgarian Rhythm number 2. It's number 115 out of volume 4. First, it might be helpful to do a quick overview of the piece. We can see that the piece is in 5-8 time, and the groupings are 3 plus 2. So, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2. Also, we notice that the piece seems to have G as a prominent pitch. It might be a little difficult to call this the key of G, so instead we say that it has centricity about the pitch G. And we see that this is rather consistent in the first eight measures. As a matter of fact, it seems like a self-contained section here, an A section. Now the pitch G is paired with a D, and this is a rather tonal fifth relationship. We see this throughout the section. But interestingly, we also see a C sharp. I'll have to come back and try to explain that. Now by the time we get to the end of the phrase, we see the makings of a G major triad, G, B, D, but also with a B flat. So we have a G major and a G minor at the same time. Now, moving on to measure nine, the pitches and motivic elements change, so we have a different section. We can see that F sharp becomes a prominent pitch. We can also see that the groupings are no longer three plus two, but now two plus three. So we'll call this a B section. I think it's probably best explained as a bridging section, and we'll try to explain that in more detail when we come back to it. Picking up in measure 17, the motivic material is very much the same as we had at the beginning of the piece, but now it's at a different pitch level. Instead of G, it's D. This, of course, is the dominant of G. So we better call this a new section. We could call it the C section, although it is very reminiscent of the A section, so you could conceivably call it an A prime section, at least through measure 22. And then at that point, it seems as though Bartok is trying to reintroduce G as a central pitch. We see the pitch D moving downward to G, and that's pretty consistent all the way to the end. So he's pushing us to the end of the piece, where we have some interesting cadential figures that settle on G. And this confirms the centricity about G for the whole piece. And here again we have the makings of a G major triad, G, B, D. We'll come back and try to analyze the harmonies in these measures. Notice that the B flat is never very far away. 
Even though there are elements of a G major triad, the minor aspect of the triad seems relevant also. Let's take a closer look at the motive at the beginning of this piece. Starting on G, it goes up a whole step, up a whole step, down a half step, up a whole step. To me, it looks like it's sort of zigzagging on the way ascending, so I'm going to call it the ZZ motive. Immediately following, we see the motive, which has arrived at C sharp, now descending a whole step, a whole step, up a half step, down a whole step. It is the exact inversion of what we saw in the first measure. Another way to look at this motive is to see how it is partitioned into three notes and then two notes. You could think of the first three notes coming from a whole tone scale starting on G, and then when we get to the B flat, we move to the other whole tone scale. There are only two whole tone scales. Because of this clear partitioning, I'm going to label the first three notes as motive fragment X, and then the next two notes as motive fragment Y. Also keep in mind, if you look at all the notes in these two measures, you've got the complete set of chromatic pitches from G to C sharp. Now we've already talked about the fact that this piece has very clear centricity on G, and it is supported by the pitch D, the dominant pitch, in very close proximity. But also important to Bartok in these two measures is the pitch C sharp, both the peak and the nadir of these lines, and this helps to create a wonderful sense of symmetry that carries right through to the end of this piece. Let's go ahead and expand our view to measures 1 through 8. See how the ZZ inverted motive from measure 2 is carried into measure 5, but placed on the higher pitch level of D, and then it sequences a step lower in measure 6. The X inverted fragment of measure 2 has a slight intervallic alteration in measure 5, and then it sequences a step lower in measure 6. Now look at how the X prime fragment is augmented and then placed in the left hand in counterpoint in measures 5 and 6. Then it sequences a step lower in measures 7 and 8. The Y fragment from measure 2 carries into measures 5 and 6 also with a slight expansion of interval in measure 6. Now there's a lot going on here to establish G as a central pitch. Look at the span in the right hand part in measure 5 to 6 and then of course 7 to 8 from D to G which comes about as a result of that expanded interval of the Y fragment. And then look at how the cadence going from measure 7 to 8 establishes all the pitches of the G major triad, the D, the B, and the G. Of course, that C sharp tritone pitch is still here, and we should take note of that as well. This one here in measure 4 is uh, particularly notable because it seems so tonal. Look, the C-sharp is paired with the A. In a tonal analysis, that's a 5 of 5. In other words, the A, C-sharp are the essential parts of the A major triad, which is the 5 chord of D, and the D appears in measure 5. Nonetheless, I think it's time to consider the symmetric implications of the C-sharp. Of course, C-sharp is a tritone away from G. But also important is the fact that if you take a chromatic scale from G to G, the central pitch of that scale will be C-sharp, dividing the chromatic scale symmetrically. Now Bartok is very fond of these symmetries, and I think he'd like to further this process by dividing the distance from the G to the C-sharp in half, and also from the C-sharp to the G. That introduces the pitches B-flat and E, and this we will call the symmetric axis about G the tonic axis for this piece. And since we know that Bartok is fond of combining symmetric organization with tonal organization, let's go ahead and build an axis on the subdominant and also on the dominant. Actually, this is not that hard to do. You can see that this is just minor third intervals and harmonically going around a circle. Now, if we return to the first section of this piece, we'll find all kinds of structural points that match with this tonic axis of symmetry. The G, the B flat, the C sharp. Notice that these are all metrically strong locations. If we continue further into measure 5, we can complete this circle of symmetry by finding the E in the left hand before the resolution back to G. Let's go ahead and move forward now to that new area that I was calling a bridging section, starting in measure 9. While the earlier section ended with clear tonic implication, we find something quite different in this new section. 
The G has moved a half step down to F sharp in measure 9, and for that we should refer to the subdominant axis of symmetry. In measure 9, we see strong entrances of F sharp and A, both elements of the subdominant axis. F sharp is paired with its fifth related pitch C sharp, and A with its fifth related pitch E, and these pitches continue right through measure 15. Now, trace the A pitch in the right hand as it ascends chromatically and arrives on the pitch C, the most prominent pitch of the subdominant axis. In the left hand part at measure 13, this pitch is picked up and harmonically as B sharp, and then moves chromatically back down to A by measure 15. Now, take a look at the large scale chromatic motion as F sharp in measure 9 moves down to F in measure 12, connecting through E in measure 13, and then arriving on E flat in measure 16. This makes the subdominant axis complete. Interestingly, it also hints at a collection of notes that are familiar in traditional harmony, the French augmented six chord, E flat, G, A, C sharp, but without the G, and also inverted. This is a very traditional way to get to the dominant, which is coming right up in measure 17. Now, in this A prime section at measure 17, the pitch center is D, and motive ZZ returns at the D pitch level. Bartok presents the motive in close imitation at measure 18 in the left hand, and because of its symmetric structure, from D to the tritone G sharp, we have two measures of a mirror technique in measures 18 and 19. Mirror technique is when a line is presented simultaneously with its inversion, and it's a favorite technique of Bartok. Let's bring in a diagram of the dominant axis. The D, F, and G sharp pitches are all here in metrically strong locations. In measure 21, Bartok transposes motive ZZ up a tritone, and the pitch B is now apparent to complete the dominant axis. Measure 23 gives us a return of the inverted and altered ZZ motive that we first heard back in measure 5. The ultimate cadence to G is being prepared. Look at the extension and repetition in measures 26, 27, and 28. This area is transitional as well. The dominant axis seems clear from measure 23 to measure 25, but elements of the tonic axis overlap beginning in measure 24. The G, B flat, and then C sharp in measure 27. Those ascending minor 7th intervals in the left hand create lots of exciting tension. This is happening as the tonic axis gets reestablished. And finally we hear the pitch E in measure 29, the completion of the tonic axis. As typical with Bartok, traditional tonal relationships often play an important role. Here, beginning at measure 29, we have a sequence of descending perfect fifths, starting on E in the left hand and continuing on to G, E, A, D, G. The traditional harmonies are somewhat approximate, but we can hear a six chord moving to two, actually better analyzed as a five, seven, a five with a four, three suspension. And then we're on to an authentic five, seven to one cadence, also with a four, three suspension. A perfect mix of symmetric material with tonal impetus. Let's go back now and listen to the whole piece to try to hear these interesting relationships and interactions. <laughs> 